Starship 15 has passed its tests and is go for liftoff. SpaceX is back to launching Starlink missions. Crew 2 joins its sister ship at the Nest, and we conclude with several honorable mentions. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. On Monday, SpaceX's latest Mars rocket prototype, Starship SN15, underwent its first static fire, lighting up its three newly designed Raptor engines. The engines kicked up so much dust it caused the vehicle to have a sneezing fit. And SpaceX tested these RCS thrusters because they will be used to help control the attitude of the rocket during flight maneuvers. But poof practice hasn't just been going on at the launch site. Lab Padre's cams also caught engineers performing cold squirts out of a different nose cone up at the construction yard this week. So be sure to subscribe to Lab's channel because their cameras are always exposing SpaceX's sexy secrets. Shortly after SN15 static fire, Elon wrote static fire completed, preparing for flight later this week. But his crew then went on to put the rocket through a second static firing the following day. <laughs> Testing header tanks, all good so far. On Wednesday, the FAA authorized the launches of SpaceX's next three starships, including SN15, due to the few changes that have been made to the vehicle and SpaceX's reliance on the FAA's methodology to calculate the risk to the public. Prior to 15's launch, the governing agency will verify the rocket manufacturer implemented corrective actions arising from 11's mishap investigation. And for the launch of 16 and 17, SpaceX may be subject to additional corrective actions if any new mishap investigations were to occur. SpaceX was aiming to launch SN15 today, but it was not to be. And although there are no road closures in place at this moment, the FAA does have notice in place throughout the weekend. However, it should be noted that SpaceX doesn't do launches on weekends per their agreement with the county, so we may be looking at Monday at the earliest. On Wednesday night, the Starbase team also put the newly developed test dummy nose cone through a Max-Q simulation, and it did survive to die another day. And today, SN16's lower half was moved to the high bay for final nose cone integration. On the far side of the launch site sits the orbital launch tower, sprouting taller by the week as construction crews continue to water and fertilize it. It'll be used to launch and catch starships and super heavy boosters in the near future, a strategy Elon and his SpaceX team decided to opt for after struggling to find a proper landing leg solution. The Chinese Communist Party seems to be completely oblivious to this weight issue. Ars Technica reported this week that the CCP has chosen to build their own fully reusable super heavy program for point-to-point -point transportation around the globe. A bootlegged rendering of their proposed rocket was uploaded online, showing off a strikingly familiar vehicle doing very familiar things. But check your privilege, America. Sure, their regime may be known for stealing tech, sloppy biohazard management, and the oppression of its people sprinkled with genocide, but they're not copying SpaceX's Mars rocket if that's what you were judgmentally thinking you racist. Because this only concerns Earth travel, something SpaceX hasn't even mentioned doing in like four weeks. And again, they obviously aren't using catch towers either, yet. So this is a totally different animal. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if SpaceX copied China, because frankly, the animation looks old, like it was made with Windows 98 or something. This isn't the first time a foreign country permanently borrowed SpaceX's designs. China and Russia have both taken a liking to the Falcon 9 look in the recent past. And speaking of copycats, Jeff Bezos' company, Blue Origin, is fighting NASA's Human Landing System award to SpaceX, and so too is Dynetics, actually. Filing a protest with the Government Accountability Office, claiming the space agency moved the goalpost at the last minute and improperly evaluated SpaceX's proposal while giving their own an unreasonable evaluation. Elon responding like the boss we've all come to know and love, they can't get it up, to orbit. Loud out laugh. Perhaps it's because Jeff is their leader. It is like a weak ejaculation. Okay. <laughs> Jeff. Okay, all right. Or Elon thinks Blue Origin's bid was just way too high. Double that of SpaceX, and SpaceX has much more hardware progress. And actually, he thinks old Jeffy needs to run Blue Origin full time for it to be successful. Frankly, I hope he does. But the HLS win isn't the only beef GIFs companies have with SpaceX. Amazon is also objecting to the FCC's approval of Starlink's network change. After more than 1,500 of SpaceX's satellites reach orbit, Elon's company plans to park roughly 3,000 new satellites into a much lower orbit under 500 kilometers. This would improve internet latency and reduce light pollution during morning and evening hours, as well as decrease the deorbit time of malfunctioning satellites. Opponents of Starlink are saying this will cause interference with their networks, 
However, Elon wrote the FCC is fair and sensible. 99% of the time he agrees with regulators, only disagreeing on rare occasions mostly due to new technologies they develop that past regulations don't anticipate. In other news, Robert Garcia, the mayor of Long Beach, California, is excited to announce and welcome SpaceX to his town. But if you've been following SpaceX since their BFR days, don't get too excited because I know what you're thinking. No, SpaceX is not moving Starship development back to their property at the port of LA again. What's really happening here is SpaceX appears to be moving their port of San Pedro location slightly east to the port of Long Beach to bigger real estate. It seems the company is preparing for the high cadence of booster and fairing recoveries from Starlink launches out of Vandenberg occurring this summer. On Wednesday, SpaceX made a return to launching Starlink satellites into space after a brief pause for the Crew Dragon mission. This was the seventh flight for this first stage booster that eight minutes later landed on the drone ship just read the instructions out in the Atlantic. An hour later, all 60 birds were released without incident, bringing the total count closer to 1,400 operational spacecraft in orbit. The next Falcon 9 launch will be Starlink's 26th mission overall, slated for May the day before the 5th. Last week, the Crew-2 astronauts launched to orbit and made their way toward the space station. During the trip, astronaut Thomas Pesquet was kind enough to snap some pics and share them with the world, one of which was of their rocket's second stage flying information with them before it deorbits, another of some zero-g nap action, and one of the capsule's almighty space turlet slash ice cream dispenser. Chocolate only. On Saturday morning, they reached the nest where their sister dragon was waiting, docking it autonomously at the port next to her. The station now has 11 occupants, and that is until the crew of Crew-1 disembark for their return to Earth, which was supposed to happen on April 28th, then May 1st, but sketchy weather keeps pushing the date. They're now targeting Sunday, May 2nd for Splashdown. And now it's time for today's Honorable Mentions. <laughs> Yesterday, Blue Origin revealed you can now finally sell off your home and every asset you own for a down payment on a seat to space. Well, you can't buy the seat yet, but you can sign up today to learn how you can purchase a seat to suborbit on their new Shepard rocket starting May the day after the 4th. Our second honorable mention is NASA JPL, who took the Ingenuity helicopter for a third spin up on Mars earlier this week. The Martian chopper traveled almost half the length of a football field and reached an airspeed of four and a half miles per hour. Never flying this fast before, not even during Earth-based tests. The next flight will be a 266 meter round trip and after landing it, will process 60 black and white images to generate three-dimensional detailed elevation maps. And our last honorable mention is American astronaut Michael Collins, who passed away from his battle with cancer on Thursday at the age of 90. Collins was known as the loneliest man in history for the role he played on Apollo 11. While Armstrong and Aldrin were walking on the lunar surface and the entire world watched on their televisions, Mike orbited the moon by himself for 28 hours as the command module pilot. Now with Collins gone, we are only left with 10 of the original 24 Apollo astronauts. Well, that's all I have for you guys today, but have a nominal weekend. And until next time, Godspeed. Hey guys, thank you for tuning in. And I just want to say thank you so much for just the, the overwhelming support I received since last Friday's episode. The number of emails I've gotten has just been astounding. So great. And I apologize if I haven't gotten back to you yet. Believe me, I will. And the number of new patrons, the number of you who have signed up uh, to support the channel in the last week has been just so cool. And even t-shirt sales. <laughs> it's just never sold so many t-shirts before. It's great. It's always encouraging to know that there are other like-minded individuals out there that have your six. Freedom-loving and liberty-loving patriots out there. And I don't just mean in America. I mean all over the world I've received emails and support from. In my, in my opinion, even if you are from another country, if, if you stand for freedom, you're more American than many people I know. But thank you guys again, and uh, I look forward to next week. And until that time, Godspeed.